afternoon from the very sunny campus of The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and welcome to this Creative Pathfinders conversation. We're delighted to have you with us today. Creative Pathfinders is a series of virtual conversations that highlights the careers and accomplishments of Ohio State Arts alumni created uh, in 2020 by then director of the Barnett Center, Allison Cressetta. The series celebrates the accomplishments of arts graduates and also enriches our relationships with our alumni network, now more than 600,000 worldwide. The series is a collaboration between the Barnett Center, a specific arts unit or center here at The Ohio State University and is supported by the Office of Advancement within the College of Arts and Sciences. Allow me to share with you just a little bit about the Barnett Center for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it created by a generous gift from the Barnett family. The Barnett Center educates and prepares students for successful careers in the arts and related entrepreneurial fields while also advancing student understanding of the arts, arts management, policy, and culture through entrepreneurial thought and action. Vibrant partnerships with each of the arts units and centers here at Ohio State, other campus constituents, and the Columbus Arts community are central to the mission of the center. The Barnett Center contributes to the curricular offerings focused on arts entrepreneurship and arts management by offering programs, working with students across disciplines, and housing the Barnett Fellows. For more information about the Barnett Center, feel free to visit barnettcenter.osu.edu. The moderator for this afternoon's conversation is Marine Vanderheiden. Since becoming director of the Urban Art Space in 2017, Marine has provided leadership and strategic management for that entity, supporting and promoting the academic mission, arts curriculum research, cultural leadership, and artistic and intellectual enrichment of the College of Arts and Sciences and The Ohio State University. Ryan oversees the urban art space's ongoing development as an academic arts resource that is integrally connected to teaching, learning, and research, and central to the university's campus and community engagement efforts. Ryan considers her work with her students to be one of her deepest passions. It is her privilege, she says, to be part of their path at a point when it is possible to dream big, to take risks, and to at times fumble through what feels like an impossible challenge to learn something along the way and to thrive. Please welcome to our conversation this afternoon, Marine Vanderheiden. Thank you so much, Scott, for that generous welcome. Um, I'm so grateful to be here and welcome everyone. As Scott mentioned, um, Marine Vanderheiden uh, is my name. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, just a little description of me. I have slightly messy shoulder length, uh, dark blonde hair, and I'm wearing a pair of black, black rimmed uh, reading glasses. I'm in my home office right now with a white wall and a window covered by a shade just behind me. So as Scott mentioned, um, I am the director of Urban Art Space, and I've been with Urban Art Space since 2013, initially when I was hired as a deputy director of exhibitions and curatorial practice. Um, I've been in the director's role since late 2017. So um, when Scott asked me to propose an Urban Art Space alumni discussion for this series, I immediately thought of Kelly Stavels who served as the inaugural deputy director of Urban Art Space when the space first opened in 2008. Most recently, um, Urban Art Space has welcomed Dr. Tehran Banner to our staff. Tehran has been with Urban Art Space since the start of this year, and he serves in the newly re-envisioned role of manager of community yeah. learning and experience. Kelly and Tehran share many overlapping connections and interests, including the fact that they both graduated with advanced degrees from OSU's Department of Arts Administration, Education and Policy. And as self-proclaimed arts policy nerds, it really seemed fitting today to pair them for the discussion. But before handing the mic to Kelly and Tehran so they can introduce themselves, I will give you a really brief introduction to Urban Art Space. So established in 2008, Urban Art Space was designed as a dynamic, adaptive, and experimental arts center 
and as a true extension of The Ohio State University, purposed with the idea with, with adapting really to the dynamic needs of Ohio State's arts curriculum, as well as university local and surrounding communities. So Urban Art Space is in downtown Columbus, neighboring the Ohio State campus and creative and cultural hotspots, such as the Short North Arts District, the Franklinton Arts District, and the Bronzeville and King Lincoln District. Most recently, so in the last couple of years, um, through six months of research and collaboration, Urban Art Space partnered with um, Millard Consulting to evaluate its value proposition and create a new strategic plan. So as a result of that new plan, we've been able to re-articulate Urban Art Space's vision and mission, which is to create vibrant arts experiences between campus and community. Experiences that truly challenge perceptions, deepen learning, and increase access to the arts. So Urban Art Space coordinates these efforts to challenge and push the boundaries of how art is imagined, made, viewed, and understood, mainly through its programming models across its three venues. First, we have the historic Lazarus Building, um, venue, the urban art space itself in downtown Columbus. There's Hopkins Hall Gallery on the Ohio State campus. And um, over the last couple of years, we have truly added or we've, we've maximized our online capacity uh, through our digital platform, which we call Urban Art Space or UAS Online. So Operationalizing this new strategic plan, uh, we created the Hybrid Arts Lab programming model in 2020 in direct response to the needs of Ohio State's arts units during the first few months of pandemic. And Hybrid Arts Lab facilitates interdisciplinary work across arts units and media and provides creative and experiential space accessible to multidisciplinary groups and encourages and disseminates arts-based research, negotiations and discussions and more. As such, Hybrid Arts Lab was designed to actively support learning and knowledge sharing fostered by the university and the arts. Since 2020, um, other programming efforts such as Summer Series, uh, it's a programming series that has been in place for a few years now, but, but since 2020 has been reframed and expanded to serve the needs of the local communities as well. So Summer Series programming strategically encourages collaborative, multidisciplinary approaches and ideas that foster conversations, relationships, or careers that um, represent diverse perspectives. And lastly, I will say, as the world continues to deal with, uh, with global pandemic, with ever widening disparities and war and political and social unrest, urban art space has begun to reevaluate its position as an art center, as a community organization and an extension of higher education in relation to all of these things. Specifically, um, Urban Art Space has increased its focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access through programming and practices. Urban Art Space has begun uh, approaching these efforts with more critical intentionality in, in addressing these social issues impacting the communities we serve through using our space and programming as a pedagogical site and tool for learning and community building. This is also the premise in so many ways of today's conversation. And with this, and without much further ado, I would love to introduce Kelly and Charan to the conversation. So after they introduce themselves briefly, they will talk about the current arts ecosystem and how this has impacted and affected arts policy, including policy at Urban Art Space and the Wexner Center, where Kelly currently serves as co-interim director. Uh, Kelly and Teron, on to you right now. Uh, thank you. Those were two great introductions. Um, so we definitely are appreciative of the opportunity to talk more about these things that we're passionate about um, and, and our overlapping experiences here at OSU, the Wexner Urban Arts Space, and 
last but certainly not least, uh, AAEP, Arts Administration Education and Policy Department. So I'll begin um, with short introductions and a description of the space that we're in. So again, my name is Teron Banner. Um, I go by the he, him pronouns. I am an African-American male um, with a light tan brown shirt, a full beard and locks that are braided to the back. Um, the space we're in is in the lower gallery space of the urban art space. Um, we have white walls with exposed cement floor um, behind three large windows with natural sunlight streaming through. Great. Thanks, Ron. I'm Kelly Stevo. I'm um, thrilled to be back in the urban art space, which has played an important part in my career, and it's fun to be here today talking with Ron. Um, I am um, a white woman with short, curly brown hair. I'm wearing a black blazer and a black shirt with a gold necklace, um, and my pronouns are she, her, and I think we're going to jump right into the conversation. So I'm going to let Teron kick things off. Definitely. So um, hopping right into it, one of the things that we really thought about and talked about was understanding the arts as an ecosystem and kind of our position um, in these organizations and our position um, as artists and arts administrators in this ecosystem. Um, I think it's important to understand the dynamic of this. Oftentimes, um, art um, departments, art curriculum, and art institutions are siloed, and that can impact the um, effects and results of our efforts. And I think it's, it's better to look at this in totality to understand that it is in fact a field. Um, and with that understanding, all of our efforts, contributions, programming initiatives work together, um, particularly for the betterment of the community, whether that be the Ohio State community, students and staff, faculty, or the Columbus community and the um, more specific communities that are within the Columbus the Columbus area. Yeah, I think this is something that we just agree on so much where, um, you know, I think so often when you talk with people, it's always interesting to me when you ask, you know, you say you work someplace like the Urban Arts Space or the Wexner Center for the Arts, how you get reactions from people who say, oh, you know, well, the arts isn't something that's part of my life. Um, and I always love the trouble that idea because I think when you look around us um, and, you know, from what we're wearing to the spaces that we're in, um, you know, visual culture and music, um, the arts are something that are enriching everyone's lives and they just don't always recognize it because of, you know, I think a lot of how we educate students and we think about how art education shows up into classrooms that, you know, we're training people to think that art means a really specific things. And so the more we can look at ourselves as an ecosystem and point to one another, point to the makers in our community, and the valuable contributions they're making to our society right alongside, you know, um, artists we might be bringing into the Wexner Center for the Arts for residency programs. And um, that all of that contributes to the health and vitality of our communities and the way we are thinking about work and our lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that coming out of COVID and at this time, particularly in central Ohio, when there's a lot of change in leadership happening, um, you know, both across the arts units on campus and within our um, sort of major museums, the Wexner Center for Arts and the Columbus Museum of Arts is going under an executive director search that we're just emerging in this environment that really allows us to be creative about how we work together and uh, chart a new path forward for our community. Yeah, I think an important uh, topic of that or aspect of that is community. And I think, you know, post COVID or coming out of COVID, I should say, really have begun to reframe and rethink what community means. Um, oftentimes, our descriptions of community is relegated to proximity, distance, um, or, or where we are within a, a particular position in a community. So I think now um, there are shared experiences more now than ever, right, that, that supersede distance and, and regional and local barriers. And that has really shaped relationships. And I think with that, we have to understand community is about relationships and experiences. Um, and oftentimes experiences from specific communities have been kept on the fringe of discussions within art, art institutions, um, art programming. And that has marginalized and continue to do that. And unfortunately, COVID has um, magnified and exaggerated those issues, um, but it also brought them to the forefront. 
So I think it's important that we understand that community is about experiences. And with that, we are all, um, we have a privilege and we have a responsibility to understand our position within that. And as a part of that, you know, that global community, um, that national community, and really um, ensure that we are using our resources and our, our uh, tools to implement strategies, uh, programming, educational components that address and welcome and invite all perspectives and, and um, community members. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something, um, you know, I know what I was here at the Urban Arts Space that I know you all have continued is really thinking about how to amplify student voices and build connections between campus and community. I know at the Wexner Center for Arts, we we're talking about this a lot. Our, um, you know, when you look at the roster of artists we've worked with historically, that, um, you know, we're really proud of the kind of voices that we've been able to amplify as an institution. And so how can we continue to do that with more intentionality, but also reflect internally to say, hey, does our staff reflect the kind of artists um, that we're presenting? Um, does our board also reflect um, the communities that we're serving? And so I do think it's really a time of reckoning where um, we've all been talking about these issues, but now more than ever, I know, it, you know, for me personally coming out of COVID too, it just, I think it really allowed everyone to take stock of um, their values and what's important and, and be very intentional about how we spend our time with one another how precious it is, whether it's through new technology, enabling us to connect with people we weren't easily able to do so before, or getting to be in person <laughs> and have a discussion is like so novel at this point after two years of doing everything online. Um, and, you know, it's just, and how, like, uh, I think really also thinking about what privilege do we each have in the space that we occupy and how are we able to use that to make the changes we wanna see in the world. Um, is critical for arts institutions at this time. Definitely. And like Marine was saying earlier, we um, have just really begun to finalize our um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access action plan. And it, it's just that I think we have to also shift how we think about these initiatives, right? Um, is it just a statement or is it actually something that we work towards? It's a living document, it's an, an actionable item. And within that, we really identified, um, like Kelly was saying, the need for uh, self-work, right, and self-education and addressing inherent biases, um, because in turn, those things play out in how we address problems, how we understand and, and, and frame conversations, and how we um, incorporate diverse perspectives. So it is a lot of self-work and self-reflection, and I think that's more important now than ever as we deal with some of these issues which are life-threatening, right, and which have been exposed to an extent by the conditions going on. Um, and they are more prevalent in communities. And I think that kind of leads us to the, the next section of communities and cultural sections, sectors and uh, creative sectors. You know, um, I think our locations, we, we are very unique and we are close to all these different sections, right? Um, Franklinton, Short North, um, the Bronzeville, King Lincoln district as well. And I think we have to understand our position within those within those areas. Yeah, and I think that's something too for us at the WEX. Um, you know, as we do think about our our equity work and how we're engaging communities, um, also making sure you know technology has allowed us to go out of communities in new ways. And as we are doing more things in person, how are we going out? So I have to give a shout out. We have an amazing <laughs> learning and public practice program led by Dion Custer Edwards, and she has this incredible artist Jean Pittman on the team. And they're um, really doing some incredible work going out into like the Linden community for community artist studios. They did that as a pilot this past year and it was really successful. So, you know, again, just, you know, how this whole ecosystem works together, how as a, um, you know, as policymakers, um, city council, the Columbus Commission funding the Greater Columbus Arts Council, who in turn is funding our organizations, right? How does this all fit together to allow us to better serve our communities? How does the very like personal, work we're doing around um, our DEI initiatives also then get reflected in the institutional policy, whether it's budgeting. Um, and then how does that inform our neighborhoods and communities where we still have, especially in Columbus, you know, significant inequities one neighborhood to the next. Um, and so, you know, being in an art space, getting to engage all these conversations is um, I think something that's really inspiring and helps continue to like motivate 
um, me to get up every day and then trouble this idea of like, where can we make the biggest difference, right? As artists and arts administrators, how do you show up and move the needle on some of these issues that we know will be forever work, um, but is also work that we need to be doing right now. Yeah, and I think th this idea of space, right? Virtual and physical. Um, we've seen a shift uh, with COVID and where a lot of things we looked at more virtually and, and digital. But as we get back into opening up, <laughs> you know, the, the city and um, the country and the world for that matter, we also have to be understanding of the built environment and um, art role in that and also the ethical part of that. And I think a lot of time with creative sectors, um, as we've seen here in, in Columbus, um, there is a lot of commercialization, gentrification and displacement, which goes and addresses issues of accessibility um, for local residents, for artists who have been there. And you know, how do we, how can we better understand and have a conversation surrounding the issues we're, we're keeping these, these cultural communities and these, these creative sectors organic, true to their roots, um, while also providing resources, tools, and support um, for them. But, you know, as an extension of OSU and higher education and, and our position as art centers, you know, what tools and what programming, what efforts can we bring to that conversation? How can we better understand how the built environment is just that? Right? It's not just the physical structures, but it's also the programming that goes within it. It's also the experiences and the conversations that happen within these environments that are important as well. For sure. And I mean, I think, um, Teron, your point is something that I think is so important, this acknowledgement of the fact that, um, you know, you have to work within the systems you're trying to change, right? And um, understand the boundaries. And it, and it seems to me that, you know, again, all that change, even with policy, like I appreciated um, through the arts policy and administration program, you know, one of the um, quotes that I heard then that has informed my career as an administrator and even as um, fundraising, all the work that I've been doing is to speak to where people are listening from. And I just think, you know, that informs so much of how we need to engage with one another, um, especially with the political environment being so divisive right now. Um, I do think finding ways to create connections and build bridges you know, how do we have artists in dialogue with um, policymakers? Um, we're right here by the state house. Do we do that often enough? Um, I think, you know, and at the end of the day, all of that comes back down to trust. And I feel like the arts are just uniquely positioned um, to really facilitate those kinds of conversations and allow people to see these multiple perspectives where, um, you know, we were, we're looking at the same interest issue as far as like, uh, improving a neighborhood and seeing that as, oh, this is good because we're helping to make it safer, make it cleaner, make it more attractive, you know, raise um, real estate prices, but at the same time, being able to actually acknowledge who's being displaced and what's happening, um, you know, what kind of investment is being made to improve those lives too. And I think so often that's where that difference in perspective, and art is so much about perspective, right? That difference in perspective and how to bridge the gap between how people are viewing that issue, um, that art can, again, just play such a unique role in our institutions and helping to facilitate those conversations, play a really unique role in trying to inform these big social issues. Yeah, and I think art does that, right? Art is a universal language. Art is a way of looking at things. It provides a, a critical lens for all these issues. Um, during my time in the AAEP department as well, I can remember, um, I read a book um, called Pedagogy of the Oppressed by, yeah. by Paulo Freire. And one of the quotes that stuck out to me is that, um, the, you know, you can't, uh, I'll paraphrase, right? The oppressed has to be a part of the solution, mm -hmm. right? It, we can't, as art centers, universities, community organizations, have this savior complex where we're coming in and we're going to solve the issues without having the community voices um, at the table. And I think that's important. And I think we're doing that again through the context of art, right? Um, inviting those diverse perspectives and valuing them. It's not just happening at the table, but it's actually um, how we utilize them, how we value them and how we hear them. Um, you know, in having uh, proposals and exhibitions and programming, that is actually community centered, right? And what does that mean? It's not, again, our responsibility to think for the community, but it's actually having them as the driving force. Um, 
I think that's you know how we can do these things responsibly and uh, a tool that art allows us to, to utilize for sure. Um, and I think as you were talking about kind of this this research that goes into that, right? Because of course, being a part of yeah. <laughs> OSU is a you know R one research institute. Um, and funding and, and things of that nature are, are really driven by research. Um, but we can't look at communities as uh, something we pull from, right? As research subjects. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. But like you were saying, we have to work with and within these communities. Um, and that's really the type of research that we have to be, um, you know, really, really geared towards. I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, my, in graduate school, I was really interested in these ideas of emerging and professionalism. And, you know, I think, you know, which is again, and I'm continue to be very interested in issues of class and um, power structures and what defines and uh, how do people have access to changing their own status or influence in communities. And I think, um, you know, knowing that again, that we're talking about like arts administration and policy too, is just thinking about how you know, within our organizations, we are evaluating these issues all the time, right? And, and what does leadership look like? And what kind of leadership can an artist provide? And how can communities, you know, I think just to amplify what you're saying, also like how can we go into communities instead of looking at them as a source of information for us to solve the problem, realize that a lot of those communities probably have some answers to the problems they're dealing with and just need the support and resources to be able to address them. And so what role, again, do we as arts organizations play in telling these stories and lifting up these voices and also, um, you know, in particular being in a place like the WEX, like how do we, um, because we do have a significant kind of footprint we take up in this arts ecosystem, how do we help shift the dialogue for everyone around funding for this kind of work? Um, because, you know, as um, actually in a meeting this morning, we were talking about, um, you know, our missions are uh, inspiring and compelling, but at the end of the day, they do rely on financial resources to be able to do that work. And so, um, especially in a, a place like the US where um, our 501c3 tax status you know, enables us to fundraise, but that's also kind of a blessing and a curse, right? Because you're um, beholden to a donor community uh, that may or may not see these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do we help to continue to, um, you know, work within the system that we have and trouble it as well? Right, right. And I think, you know, around the conversation of research and funding, um, one thing that I've wrestled with, you know, here, I think we're really looking at it um, from a different perspective at the urban art space is what are the, the impact measurements, mm -hmm. right? And I think once you can begin to really understand impact measurements as units of measurement for your research and for your data, then you can collect and utilize quantitative data, which again, we, we know is, is, a, <laughs> is a necessity, um, but you can do it from a, a qualitative um, standpoint, if that makes sense. So I think oftentimes in the arts, the unit of measurement that is so prevalent is the individual. Mm -hmm. You know, this person came to this event, they visited us, they went out and did this, this is how we measure success. Mm -hmm. And while that's great, that's not necessarily how the arts work. Mm -hmm. um, the arts, again, it, it's a field. So I think we have to understand that everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, is gonna have a role in bettering individuals, a community, uh, an organization, right? So how do our efforts coupled with the Wexner's efforts, coupled with CMA, coupled with, you know, the arts departments. What kind of impact do we have as a collective? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we start to understand and create measurements around that kind of community effort and our position within that field, um, I think, you know, funding and research becomes a lot more management, becomes a lot more um, effective and really focuses in on the, the key points. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, this idea of, of, you know, like talking to like the difference between like outputs and outcomes and like what kind of impact are we really making is just critical. I feel like that was such a hot topic when I was in grad school um, 20 years ago and continues to be something that within the arts community, uh, you know, I think we just need to keep evolving our thinking on it because it doesn't seem to me that anyone in particular has really figured it out, right? It continues to be the case that when there are funding challenges, 
um, you, you know about sports and arts <laughs> programming, but the first to go in schools. And so how do we as a community really um, look at that? Because I, uh, especially I'm from the Appalachian region of the state. So growing up in a community where where there was a lot of poverty and seeing firsthand food insecurity, housing insecurity. You know, I'm the biggest champion of basic needs and understanding that those have to be met first. But I do think once your basic needs are met, when you talk to people about what enriches their life, it's arts and culture, it's our natural environment. And so how do we uh, protect those things, lift those things up and amplify them? And then again look at the power of the arts because i do think everybody you know everybody um i would go so far as to say every person you could talk to has some powerful story about the arts whether they think of it in those terms or not and um i just don't think we can underestimate the role of the arts in building a civil society where we can also have respect for one another's um, opinions and viewpoints understand how to value perspectives other than our own, even if we don't agree with them. And in this uh, political climate, again, where there's such division, it seems to me that arts provide a pathway out of that um, right now. Yeah, and, and the arts have always been connected to social movements, to, to bettering communities. You know, there's a long history we could, we could go down from the 60s or you know, even up to more recent times where the arts um, are there for that, right? And I always say art is research. I think you have to reframe, yeah. reframe that and say it more um, within the field and for those outside the field, right? Art is research. Um, and if that's the case, more specifically, art is social research, right? So art deals with these issues um, in terms of community vitality, in terms of social well being, um, in terms of addressing very basic needs. Um, so art is a, a investigation of that, an exploration of that. Um, a mirror to, to reflect and show these things, and it provides conceptual thinking and, and a passion for addressing those needs, uh, very much so. Yeah, and you know, and I do think emerging out of this um, past couple of years with COVID too, with all the changes that happened with funding, it does seem to me, especially institutions like the WEX, um, but even when talking to peers across Ohio and uh, other museum directors, that the funding models that we have in place currently for, for the arts really, I mean, we knew before the pandemic they weren't working, the pandemic really laid bare that there needs to be a different kind of approach. And so trying to also be um, really innovative as arts administrators about what does this look like? Um, how do we you know, really double down on our missions in some ways while also um, you know, speaking to where people are listening from and helping them understand what you're saying that art is research, you know, that value, um, if they, if it doesn't just come to someone quickly, like how to help them see the impact that it really makes so that as a community, we could fund and support arts differently. Yeah, I think framing that conversation is important because as we know, from administration to administration, funding has gone up and down, right? So, but the, if we can frame those conversations and have data-driven results that we have very carefully and strategically um, analyzed certain units of measurement, I think it, it makes the case that arts are essential. Arts are a central part of the economy. Arts are a central part of the government. Um, arts are essential, an essential part of community well-being, um, of education. And that's really where I think there's opportunity for us as art centers, which you know, are so closely aligned to the university and curriculum and education, but also within the community um, to make an impact, right? We are very unique in that we have hands in both areas and we're able to see these things work out in real time, the effects and be forward thinking in our approaches and then take that information learned um, as experts in the field, as those who are doing, doing the groundwork and those who are interacting with community members and with artists to take those conversations and, and present them to uh, those who have are in positions of power mm -hmm. and those who can you know continue those conversations upward. So I think that that's very important as well. Yeah, and I do think that's something that's really special about and I, uh, Marian or Scott spoke to Marian's passion around students, but um, you know whether at the WEX or here at Urban Art Space, um, just this connection to campus and having this constant um, flow of students and the energy and ideas and, and um, uh, you know, 
new approaches that they have to things is really exciting. And then to see how they um, go off into the world or even for myself, right? Having been at the urban art space and now at the WEX, how um, these systems all again work together to really create a kind of shared community knowledge and, and passion that can help drive towards this vision of um, a better Columbus and a better world. Yeah, and, and speaking of you know students in the and community, I think at, you know at the Webster and at the urban art space, we really begin to look at our internship programs, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, to reframe them and rethink them. I mean, of course they are interns, but I think that that definition or that term um, undersells exactly what these students are, right? They are vital components of our organizations. Um, they, are, they are arts administrators. Mm -hmm. So really um, helping them to understand what that is. Um, arts administration is the word that's like, well, what exactly does that mean, <laughs> right? To begin with. Yeah. Um, but it's anyone who makes the arts happen, mm -hmm. whether that be through, um, you know, manning a, an actual organization center, whether it be through community initiatives, installing, striking, um, fiscal and economic uh, uh, opportunities, everything you can think of an arts administrator does. And that's really what our interns um, do. So I think it's important that we it's help them to understand their position, um, help them become more competitive, right, in, in their career paths and having those skill sets and those tools within their toolbox and um, really get them to do the work, to engage with the community because they, they are the community, they are the future. They are the future arts leaders and, and you know, those educators and, and impact people. Yeah, and I mean, I think, um, you know, that really ties into just this notion that right, good ideas can come from anywhere and how when you make space for the to happen, um, you know, whether through a lean process or um, through an internship program, like recognizing that contribution. Um, and so how in, uh, you know, arts institutions, are certainly uh, victims of institutional isomorphism or looking to how others do things and then doing it similarly, right? I do think this is also, especially for museums, a time where um, people are really thinking critically about those models and how they should be working and how do we, you know, uh, we need to have leadership and decision making, but how do we also foster an environment of collaboration and um, really bring in as many voices as we can. And I think the internship program and the changes happening there at the WEX, we've also been rethinking our docent program into a gallery educator program. Um, that work is being led in our learning public practice program. You know, I think uh, right now we're getting ready for a summer exhibition where one of our residency artists from Performing Arts is actually working to curate along with our exhibitions curator and working with our film video. Um, studio uh, manager, Jennifer Lang, and then um, Kelly Kivlin, who's our curator. You know, they're all working together to create this super dynamic summer exhibition. Um, we, you know, we don't totally know what it's gonna be yet because mm -hmm. we're just turning that space over to an artist to work with other artists. And um, even that is a radical act of um, putting, you know, sort of shifting the way museums work. Mm -hmm. And I just think if we all look for those moments in our workplaces and the things that we control on a day-to-day -day basis, we can really start to change the narrative of how um, the arts work and the impact that they make and then the way our communities recognize and appreciate them too. Yeah, and, and I think radical is a very key word, right? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it, it's going to take that kind of recognition, the time of, of risk um, and, and pushing the, the envelope forward, if you will, because it takes that for change, right? Oftentimes, art museums in particular, um, have been very much elite, right? Elitism um, and not welcoming and continue to marginalize communities. So, you know, we have to, number one, acknowledge and understand that, understand the systemic nature of that and then figure out ways to address that. And it starts internally. It starts with, you know, leadership. It, it, it goes into your programming and your um, internship and, and dossier programs. Um, building capacities to address, address these things, and then having, you know, outward facing uh, critical program and arts-based research, because art is research, right? <laughs> um, so like the model for That's the, the model, art is research, right? <laughs> you have to be to make that. Um, but critical programming, you know, I, I think is, is important. It's, you know, utilizing critical pedagogy, addressing master narratives, 
um, doing arts-based research, having grounded theory and action research, and you know, learning as you're, you're doing, because a lot of these things aren't, have not yeah. been done before. So yeah. we're, we're feeling our way through, but it's that kind of willingness to lean into it is yeah. important. Well, and I feel like you're acknowledging something important too, because change is scary. It is. So as you know, everyone's trying these new things, it, it does mean um, you know, giving up a little bit. So I think that's part of it too, right? For, for all these issues we're talking about um, is right now is you know, the idea of having to change, having to give up a little because there's so much more to, to gain and benefit. Um, you know, I, I think it's part of the arts narrative. It's part of the political narrative. Um, and getting people comfortable with those ideas um, and willing to try, right, is the first step. So, and, you know, I do think too, again, going back to thinking about the ecosystem, right, the urban art space does such interesting work with like really amplifying student and faculty. The WEX is um, a central part of what we do is really allowing artists to just come in and make and experiment and try. And for both of these spaces, you know, it's an interesting um, juxtaposition of experimentation, which means it's not always successful, but also a space where the community is coming in and doesn't always understand that, right? They think, oh, I'm coming in and it's hanging on the wall. That means it's, that means it's got the stamp of approval of the WEX or urban art space, right? And opening up that process more and being vulnerable in that way too, to our audiences, um, I think invites a different kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And again, can feel a little scary, um, right? Cause it means laying bare that we don't always know what we're doing, um, but that's also just to be human. And um, I think creates a kind of accessibility mm -hmm. that people really are clamoring for when it comes to engaging with the arts. Definitely, you know, as community learning organizations, I, I love that word. It's about community, but it's also about learning and, mm -hmm. and it's not, a top-down strategy. We're not the holders of knowledge and what we say is law and <laughs> we're gonna teach you and you're gonna leave more enriched. No, it, it's learning going both ways. <clears throat> we're learning from those visiting, we're learning from students, we're learning from artists and vice versa. So I think um, laying that as the foundation and really making sure that is known and felt is important because it's more inviting, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about spaces again and built spaces, the built environment and you know, making sure your space is being used, to use as the operative word, right? In, in a way that is addressing these things and not use as somewhere where you come and you leave and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. How does these, these lessons, these experiences live past these walls? Mm -hmm. um, or how can we bring learning outside of our walls in, into the community? Yeah, and I, you know, and I think too, like how do we keep evolving? Mm -hmm right, within all these ideas. And I think that is that having that feedback from communities, from artists, from within internally too, with our teams um, are all really critical. And I see Marines here, yes, so. so. <laughs> and I'm just here to uh, remind you that we're approaching the end of this conversation. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. Okay. So I wanted to remind the audience as well that um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function to share those with us. And uh, I'll be sure to, um, yeah, to pose those questions to Kelly and Tehran as they are still with us. Kelly Tehran, I just wanted to say from my end, thank you. This was uh, such an insightful conversation. And you, know, you really have me thinking here too. You talked briefly about working within existing ecosystems. And in our case, you know, of course, the university is such a huge part of that, which is, which is incredibly exciting. You know, I think of the university as a, as a space of, of teaching, of course, and of learning as well. And as such, you know, I think as educators and administrators, we have dual responsibilities always. Um, with that, you know, coupled, of course, the university being the kind of not always responsive system, perhaps, but definitely to a degree, I think there is an inherent kind of level of responsibility, right? That that the university takes on. And, as such, I think there are tremendous possibilities and there's potential in that system for change. You talked a lot about change and you know, from, from my end, I just, I'm so curious, what do you see most immediately? I'd like to hear from you about some of your biggest kind of um, 
accomplishments or maybe perhaps I should call them celebrations or rewards, you know, in this, if you think about the last couple of years and the challenges we've encountered, what do you see as some of your biggest kind of accomplishments or celebrations um, during that time? Um, so yeah, I guess I, I can start. And I definitely agree, you know, the university and the arts um, have foster a certain type of learning and investigation. So I think that's important to, to really um, emphasize and push forward and to utilize. And I think during the pandemic, um, or during the height of it at least, there was a disconnect um, physically and emotionally for so many people. And I think one of the real things that was rewarding for myself um, is I began to do webinars, seminars, virtual conferences um, that really dealt with connecting and connecting on a deeper level perhaps than we had normally do normally have done when there were no restrictions. Um, it forced us to sit down, it forced us to take a, an inward look and it forced us to have really tough conversations. And these, these webinars, seminars, lectures, courses, were very much centered around experiences and identity. And again, the um, silver lining, if there is one of all of this, is there were unifying experiences and being able to lean into that and to have conversations that explored many different things that just would not have been able to um, be had if we did not have that um, metaphoric and, and, and actual shutdown, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah, another thing, and, um, and it's interesting. I feel like, Moran, you posed the question sort of about personal accomplishments. I think I'm gonna talk more from an institutional perspective, mm -hmm. actually, though. Um, you know, I think, you know, um, so I joined the WEX in April of 2019. So not long before the pandemic kind of brought every brought everyone home. And when I look back on this time with my colleagues, I just, you know, I think it's amazing how the institution really rallied together to continue to support artists. Um, so really grateful to have been able to help continue investing in artists and artist making. And it was a chaotic time. It was an overwhelming time. It was an emotional time. But I think that our um, team really did, um, you know, just on a dime innovate ways that we were able to support and present artist work still. And, you know, some of the things that we were doing, um, for example, our film video program does an amazing uh, program every year that's actually coming up in a couple of weeks called Ohio Shorts, where uh, they have an open call for filmmakers in Ohio to submit new works and then they're juried in. Um, that screening will take place in our film video theater as it has for the um, you know, previous decade, but during COVID it went online. And so we went from serving 300 people with that program to having more than 2000 viewers from around the world. And so that was a really important learning opportunity for us because you know being back, we're just we're really back right now and it's and it's vibrant and it's so exciting to be back in space together. But how much um, you know, how much more accessible can we be if whenever we are able to, we also create virtual opportunities for people to create those connections that you're talking about. And so I think our team is still um, you know, the commitment within the WEX towards equity and access and um, you know, asking all these questions around change. Like I also, I um, feel really grateful to be uh, at the WEX at a time when we're having these conversations and they're um, sometimes really difficult, but I think that they're all uh, usually entered into with a lot of care. And so it's also just a privilege to be working with people who appreciate one another and the mission that, that we're all there trying to support um, in those ways. So those are things that I think I feel really grateful for at this time coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for artists, for creatives, arts administrators, art organizations, universities, yeah. um, because I think within the last, I mean, time flies, I'm thinking, what, three, three years, three, four years? Um, I have seen the most innovation and creativity from creatives, from artists, from organizations <laughs> in 10 years before that. Yeah. So I think um, there, we're at the, the front of the field, um, the learning curve, we're pushing forward, we're creating new opportunities, new technologies, new programs. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I want to commend all who have been, you know, part of this creative economy um, through the pandemic. Truly, and yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Of course, I also think about 
data mining, which you brought up, you know, data and how important data are just in the general development of, of our programming, um, but also in making the case to others, to administrators and, and leaders who might um, hold purse strings or uh, could help us fundraise or find monies for the things that we do. I think um, collectively, and I, I can't speak of course for the Wexner Center, but you know, I think um, ju just generally in academia, I, I, I believe that you know, assessment of course is being done is, and is being implemented and you know, is, is utilized. But I, I believe we can always do more and uh, it can continue to inform everything that we do. I was also thinking about storytelling and we haven't talked about that as much today, but I also, I, I believe that is another really big topic for us. Um, Tehran and I were talking recently and Tehran, I'll let you speak more about that, but you know, in terms of the, the many things that Urban Art Space, for example, has done over these years, the, the many things that we do inherently by what we do, but we, we've been recognizing that we're really horrible at telling that story. We haven't really told that story as well as you know, we probably can. As a result, you know, we keep being referred to as like the unknown gem or something like that, right? Like the place that does all these great things that people might not necessarily know about. So I'm really kind of curious quickly, and, and I think this will be the last question, for you to talk briefly about storytelling and the power of the arts as related to storytelling and, and some of the potential in that. Yeah, and I, I think that conversation, you know, what, what we did have was uh, enlightening. I think it's not just our organization. I think it's a symptom uh, or it's prevalent within the art field. Um, I think the art is so much about giving and it's a very humble field that, you know, acknowledging and, and boasting about things we have done has never been really a key factor, but I think we have to shift in terms of our understanding and how we're thinking about cataloging these things because it's very much the business side of arts as well, right? You have to have results. You have to have um, things identified and laid out to paint the picture. Um, so I think the artists and, and artists do so much within the community, within you know different fields that we have to really start telling the story and, and doing it effectively and efficiently in ways that can be um, understood and translated into dollars and, and replicable results. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And it's interesting because I thought at the WEX, we recently introduced an archivist. And so I think, right, it's both those things. It's like capturing what you have been doing and what's what's being out, coming out, but then also creating that vision going forward. And I do think as a society, right, we're trained for sound bites. We're trained to, like, we can only handle three things at a time. Um, and when you're in the arts and you're all about diverse perspectives and voices and valuing it all, it makes it really hard then to just still out this kind of um, single narrative or soundbite that's repeatable um, that really allows people to understand. And so how to do that in a way that honors, right, the real richness that is within all of our organizations, but also becomes something that's easily consumable for the audiences we're trying to reach. It's such an interesting balance to strike. Um, and it's something at the WEX we're talking about a lot right now. Um, because we too, I think, have just incredible programming. Um, we have, you know, amazing audiences starting to come in from, um, you know, we had a program with the, um, or one of the early graffiti pioneers, and we had folks coming in from like Chicago, Cleveland, but in Columbus, did people have awareness of that event? I'm not sure how much they did, right? So I feel like there's these interesting challenges too, where so much went online mm -hmm. during the pandemic, and there's so much noise when it comes to digital communication, like how do you break through that? And I do think you know, looking to artists that we work with to help tell those stories better is also a great idea. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I know we're so close to the end of this. Uh, yeah. I want to give you this opportunity, these last two minutes to share anything else that's on your minds uh, before we hand the mic back to Scott. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just very appreciative. Um, I had a conversation with an, an old friend today and um, he just really was saying that, you know, it's, it's invaluable and it's great that you have your career that is your passion. 
And, you know, I think that's so important in terms of this work, right? You have to be passionate about it um, because that's authentic and, and that's really where we make the most impact uh, internally and towards others, so. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, probably it was evident in the conversation, but I feel like these are all such big questions that we're thinking about all the time, right? Like we're certainly asking more questions than we're answering anything. <laughs> um, but I feel like that dialogue is so exciting. And so, you know, being able to continue it um, with Tehran, but also if there's anyone who is, um, you know, uh, watching this and has ideas or thoughts, I'm sure we would both welcome a continued conversation because um, obviously they'll, <laughs> there are uh, things we're thinking about all the time and um, we'll continue to think about. Thank you so, so much, Kelly and Teron. This was really magnificent. I loved hearing you. And as I said, I, I, I'd be welcoming many more of these kinds of conversations. I know that this meeting is, or this webinar is being recorded as well. So I hope collectively we can share it out with others. And um, yeah, this is an encouragement to anyone to reach out to us um, if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Continuing the uh, gratitude club here for Kelly and Tehran. Thank you so much for a really engaging conversation. For all of those of you who've taken this in live, uh, know that you'll receive a link to this recording to share freely with others who perhaps haven't been able to attend. Uh, and do let them know about uh, this session and uh, any of the great resources here that we have at Ohio State in our arts community to share and enrich your lives. We're deeply grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. And as we like to say around here on our Ohio State campus, stay close to the arts. Bye now. <laughs>